Hello, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia and the School of Sweet Georgia. Today, this is our live office hours for May 2023. Really excited to be here today. I hope everything works okay with this uh, audio, with the video. The last time the camera died, so I'm really glad that it seems to be working today. Uh, this is the session that we come to every month. We do this the last Thursday of every month at 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And this is just a chance for us to catch up inside the school and talk about sort of what's been happening, uh, what's coming, what people have been doing inside the school, all sorts of things like that. So we have a lot of things to talk about today and i um, really, really glad you guys are all here. So let's go into the slides, what I have for you guys today. These are the kinds of things that we uh, are going to talk about. Um, just some of the things that have been top of mind right now, what I'm thinking about right now, uh, talking about, about the latest updates, what's going to be coming in the school. Um, also, the upcoming events, what is happening. We have a couple of um, new things that are happening that I'm going to share about today. Um, and then also a lot of the things that are happening in the community and what we have coming. Uh, this month, I got a bunch of questions, which was fantastic. So we're going to answer a few questions, hopefully. And we have a couple of share your win things to share, things that people have been making inside the school. And all of that has been really, really cool to see. So, oh, hello. It's nice to see you guys. So Vicki, Victoria is here in the chat. She is one of our moderators inside the School of Sweet Georgia. You will see her in there. And then also, hi, Brenda. And hello, Pearl. Nice to see you guys in here. So what is top of mind? Right now, you guys will know that I recently, May, <laughs> was quite busy. I, at the very beginning of May, the first week of May, I went to a, probably my first ever, yeah, my first ever circular sock knitting machine uh, crank in event. And that was all the way in Missouri. And even though the event is about CSM knitting and we are not doing CSM knitting yet, in the school. <laughs> um, I feel like the lessons that I learned at that particular event and around CSM knitting are not unique to just that one kind of knitting. And it's the idea that whatever you want to learn, when you first start doing it, you're going to be a little bit clumsy and it's going to feel a little bit awkward, but just practice those skills over and over again, very slowly, very carefully. Um, at one point in time, I think I was cranking a little bit faster and one of the other uh, more experienced CSM knitters walked by and they're just like, just go slowly consistently, same speed, and just kind of that encouragement and reminder that it's okay, just go slow, build your skills a little bit at a time, you know, spend some time watching other people, how they do things, spend some time asking questions, how do people do things, and then really just listen, try to be a part of that community. And so that's what I have been learning um, through that particular community and trying to learn how to knit these socks on the circular sock knitting machine. Um, some of the other things that I came away with uh, from that particular session were the idea of adding other things together with your yarn, mixing and holding yarns together. We've talked about holding different yarns together for color blending and things like that, but also holding different yarns together for texture, for strength. It's almost like spinning, you know, when you choose to add different fiber fiber types together in order to spin them together to make a stronger type of yarn or make a certain kind of yarn, all of these different considerations. You can also do this by holding two different yarns together as you knit them into a fabric. And so I'm looking at knitting with lycra. What does that, what does that do? And you can do that with the machine, but I wonder if you could hold together a strand of lycra with your knitting yarn and hand knit that together. I imagine you probably could do that as well. Knitting socks with Kevlar for strength. That's not, not something I've tried yet, but I will. I have a cone of that Kevlar. Um, and then being able to use this tiny little machine to actually knit full garments on that. And I mentioned this uh, session that I went to with Pat, who was taking these um, lace yarns and knitting them on a sock knitting machine to make big long tubes, sewing them together to make full garments. And so I can kind of show you here, she has, uh, she gave me a handout with all of these, you might not be able to see it, but she's got a whole bunch of different one piece fabric designs, different ways that she has sewed together uh, fabric, long pieces of fabric to make ponchos, to make all sorts of things like that. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, how do we make 
other full size garments. So, you know, I'm taking little swatches. This is a really, really loose fabric that has been knit on that knitting machine. Um, it's knit with the, the largest stitch size possible in order to create like a long and drapey tube. This is not a tube that would be used for a sock. This is like a tube that would make, it feels great. It feels like it could be a sleeve or something like that. But this particular um, fabric is the cash silk lace mixed together with silk mist. It's a mohair and silk lace yarn. So this mixed together makes this amazing fabric that I'm trying to experiment with um, and make a full sweater out of. So all of these kinds of things, these construction techniques could also be used for a hand woven cloth for a cloth that you take off the loom and how do you sew them together to make a poncho and all sorts of things like that. So some of the things that I have been thinking about are here. So what I have discovered is like, you can see this photo here. This photo is all the yarn, the sock yarn that I took to the event in order to crank into socks. At the event, I only made one pair of socks, but I brought all this yarn with me. And so I have been hearing more and more and more about um, how a lot of knitters, a lot of crocheters, a lot of people who work with yarn and fiber and everything like that, um, during the past couple of years, we've acquired a lot of yarn and now we're having sort of a challenging time making our way through it and working with it and using it. And so one of the things that I am thinking about more and more is looking at the yarn, looking at the stash and seeing it as supplies that can be used rather than these precious things that sit on the shelf and then we just look at them. So I am looking at my yarn with more of the perspective that yes, I'm going to wind that into a ball and I'm going to use it for something and I'm going to move forward with the act of using all of that yarn. Um, the other thoughts that I have are that machine knitting is a really, really nice and quick way of using a lot of knitting yarn. Um, and so looking more at uh, exploring that machine knitting side, I know that Robin, one of our moderators in the school, she's also doing that kind of thing as well, exploring machine knitting. So looking at that, CSM knitting, the sock knitting machine, is wonderful. I love it. Um, you can. <laughs> I watched another woman at the Crankin knit one sock in 16 minutes. Um, and it's like a fully ribbed sock with a one by one rib and then a three by one rib. And uh, it was a beautiful, long, long leg length sock knit in 16 minutes. It was quite, quite cool. Um, it seemed quite common that somebody would be able to crank out a pair of socks within 40 minutes to an hour, like a full pair of socks, including uh, grafting the toe and all that kind of stuff. And so um, as a way of using up stash, using up yarn, it seems like a, a thing. It seems like a really, really good way to consider it. The other thing that I want to do is uh, later on this fall, I want to look at weaving with our knitting yarn. I feel like this has been a big no, no. People are always saying, don't weave with knitting yarn. You have to weave with weaving yarn. And so I have already given a presentation in the past about why uh, and how we can use knitting yarn in our weaving. And so this is something that I definitely want to explore more because if you have a ton of sock yarn in your stash, you want a way to use it, perhaps putting it on the loom and weaving it would be a great way to sort of play with the colors and enjoy and use that yarn and get something wonderful out of it. Um, so we're going to do a learn to weave series, uh, probably this fall. And I have that shacked Cricut Quartet, which is basically the rigid head of loom, the Cricut rigid head of loom that we converted into a four shaft loom using the add on that shacked made recently called the Quartet. And so basically this is like, uh, an, yeah, you basically modify your rigid head of loom to add these four shafts to it and you can make it use it as a four shaft loom. The other thing is that Ashford is coming out with a brand new four shaft loom as well. Right now they have table looms, they have a four shaft table loom, but it's like a really solid, like it's if you want to invest in a table loom, this is a good table loom to have. But it is a table loom that is 24 inches wide and four shafts. And that's kind of like a solid that's a solid loom. If you want to weave on a weaving loom, that's a solid loom. Um, if you go up to eight shafts, then you can get a 16 inch wide loom. And that's like a much more compact size, but then it's eight shafts. That's a very, very popular size. But Ashford is coming out with this new loom called the Brooklyn, which is coming out June, well, next month, actually, in a couple of weeks, they're going to have some more information about it. But it's like a very, very streamlined, stripped down, 
seems like a really um, a good gateway into four shaft weaving or multi shaft weaving. And so this Brooklyn is going to be a 16 inch wide weaving width loom table loom with four shafts. Um, and it seems like a really, yeah, a great entry point into multi shaft weaving. And so if we can get our hands on an Ashford Brooklyn, then perhaps we will do that learn to weave series on that particular loom, or the Cricut Quartet, and we'll see sort of about all of this kind of stuff. But yeah, could very easily pop all of these yarns into one of these four shaft looms and make a fantastic scarf like very, very quickly. Oh, so Vicky just posted a link to the Ashford website, new loom. <laughs> When I checked two days ago, it wasn't up. So it's good if that information is up now. So I'm really, really excited to hear about that. Um, now let's talk about what's happening inside the school, the things that have been coming out and what we have available. Um, right now, just recently, we came out with the course on dyeing spinning fiber. So this has come up specifically because uh, we have a number of dyeing courses at the School of Sweet Georgia where uh, we're teaching acid dyeing, uh, we're teaching acid dyeing for yarn. We do show how to dye with fiber, but people were asking specifically about how do we dye fiber and how do we dye larger volumes of fiber. Um, and so this is just a snapshot from Charlotte's course about dyeing spinning fiber. And here she dyes, this is like 100 grams. So this is basically if you're dyeing one braid of fiber or one one little chunk of fiber 100 grams four ounces um and then she also demonstrates how do you dye uh the like the entire tray if you're dyeing the entire tray maybe that's one pound of fiber how do you fit in one pound of fiber into here and how do you dye that so the whole course goes into how do you handle fiber without felting it how do you apply color what are different ways to do it all of that kind of stuff so um that course is coming out later on this summer there's going to be the second half of this course which is going to be dyeing large amounts of yarn and so that is the idea like what if you want to be able to dye a whole sweater's worth of yarn in a pot at the same time in order to make sure that like all skeins are somewhat evenly uh, colored so that way you're not getting blotchiness or you're not getting some skeins really dark, other skeins really light, all that kind of stuff. How do you dye consistently over a number of skeins? So um, that is something that has just come out. Um, Elena is saying, I seem to manage only one or two pairs of socks in a year. And that is 100% the reason why I got the CSM because I think it took me, I had one pair of socks on my needles for probably two years. And that was, I just wanted to change that. <laughs> so in any case, yeah, I've gone down that rabbit hole. It's super fun. I invite you to join me there. <laughs> Um, the next class that is coming out is the two heddles on the rigid heddle with Amanda Wood. Um, two heddle weaving, I think is what we're calling this particular class. So it is using multiple heddles on your rigid heddle loom in order to create all sorts of different sheds that allow you to create all different kinds of textures in your cloth. So not just weaving plain weave on your rigid heddle with the one heddle, but when you add two heddles, you can do things like you could weave two layers of plain weave and create a double width cloth, two layers of cloth. You can exchange the layers, do all sorts of different things. Um, and so this particular course is the one you want to watch if you're wanting to learn how to weave double weave or double width on your rigid heddle loom. So that is all coming out very, very shortly. The next one we have here is one that we filmed with Debbie Held when she was with us last year. And very, very excited for this one to come out. It is beautiful. The yarns that she spun in this class were gorgeous and so fun. And so I feel like when we are learning to spin, we really look forward to, you know, spinning consistently or spinning thin. That was my goal when I started spinning. I want to spin thin. I want to spin lace yarn. I want to spin fine. I want to spin consistent yarn, knit a sweater, knit a lace shawl, that kind of stuff. Um, but this is just fun, the exploration of playing with um, fiber that's been blended on a blending board, all of the mixing of the different colors that can happen, and then um, like using hand dyed colors, spinning in a little bit of silk, spinning in a little bit of all these things, these bits and pieces of making multicolored rolags and stuff like that. I believe 
Elna, you did a little bit of blending board work recently as well, and just made these beautiful, beautiful roll eggs. Um, super, super fun to do. And so being able to spin that in a way that is also fun. And so um, Debbie goes into a whole bunch of different techniques for how to spin thicker singles, how to spin lumpy bumpy yarns, like thick and thin yarns, how to spin cocoons, um, how to ply with another strand of maybe like a silk yarn or something like that, or a glittery yarn or making boucle, all of these different things are in this particular class. So really excited that's going to come out in June as well. Now, we also have a class that is coming out with Laura Fry, and that is about lace structure. So that is everything about Huck, Swedish, and Bronson lace. This is coming out in, I said, July. Yeah, July. Um, so lace weave structures. And so you can see here, these are the uh, projects that she has put together to demonstrate some of these projects. So this is plain weave over here, but this is the same warp, and then just changing um, the, the structure. So there's going to be something going on here in the in the threading and then also with the tie up and so you can see all of these lace holes the holes happening here in the fabric and how it also changes the appearance of the color so this is what it looks like in plain weave this is what it looks like with the lace going into it it's really really interesting so i mean if you can think about if you were to design something you could design kitchen towels with just the tiniest bit of lace trim on the edges or at the hems, just a minimal little bit of decoration. Or you could design something with like these big window panes of lace sections all over. So really, really fun, beautiful, and so colorful. I love it. So I'm really looking forward to having you guys see that as well. Now, for the upcoming events that we have, we have something that's really new um, that we just uh, scheduled. And so maybe you guys know about this book. I hope that you guys know about this book. This is called Sheep, Shepherd, and Land, and it is written by Anna Hunter. Now, Anna Hunter used to, she is the original founder of a yarn store here in uh, Vancouver, Lower Mainland area um, called Bad Anna's. And so she ran that shop for, I don't know how many years, and then she sold the shop and then moved to Manitoba, where then she started her own uh, wool farm called Longway Homestead. So she started to raise animals and then she was shearing sheep and she's spinning yarn and all of this kind of stuff. And so she has written this book sort of telling the stories of all of these sheep farmers and then also trying to um, kind of rebuild this wool industry from from the ground up, like just teaching new skills. What can we do with this fiber? What can we do? And so this book uh, was published by uh, 910 Publications, 910, which is run by Kim Worker and Kate Atherley. So Kim Worker, you might know from, she's written a number of books. She um, has written a number of crochet books. Um, she wrote the book Mighty Ugly, uh, which is all about like defeating creative boundaries and all these kinds of things, creative struggles hurdles. Uh, Kate Asserly is the tech editor at nitty.com. And so the two of them created this, this book publishing company or this publishing company. And this is the first book that they have published. Um, and so we are having Anna Hunter come and give a talk about her book, about the content of her book, about the idea of like exploring locally raised wool, um, and how you can sort of get in touch with this, this local wool um, community industry. Um, and so she's going to come give us a talk on Zoom June 7th. That's a Wednesday. It's going to be 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So anybody who is a member of the school, you guys can go to the community uh, section and then under the events calendar, you'll find the link and then you'll be able to get into the Zoom call from there. So I'm really, really um, looking forward to hearing Anna's talk about this. She's extremely passionate about her work. And uh, even Robin said she went to the book launch uh, and it was like an amazing, awesome event. So we're really, really looking forward to hearing this talk. So I hope that you guys will all join in at that time on the Zoom call so we can listen to Anna talk about the wool, uh, what she's experienced and learned from her wool journey. So that is happening. That's one thing that's been new. The other thing that is new 
is this idea that I want to propose to you guys. And this is an idea about virtual co-working or co-crafting. Um, and so this is something that Tabitha, our design director at Sweet Georgia, and I have been talking about for a bit because she does a lot of writing um, and she's participated in a number of, of writing co-working sessions. So it's a virtual co-working session where people basically get on Zoom and then they sit together while they do their work. They sit quietly. There's no chat, there's no talking, but they sit quietly on a call together. Um, and then in that way, it allows them to get more things done. It allows them to focus and concentrate. And I talked about this with Kathy yesterday as well. And they were saying that um, with their friends, they will like open up a call and then coexist together and just be together. Um, and so I <laughs> gave this a little bit of a try. I started to do a little bit of research into this idea and trying to understand the benefit of co-working. Why is it that when you go to a coffee shop, you can get more writing done? Why is it that when you are sitting next to somebody, you can focus and get more work done? And so I started to look into this idea of this body doubling or having an accountability partner. And so body doubling is something that comes up uh, as a practice for people who have uh, ADHD. And it's the idea that there's another person who kind of sits alongside you and helps anchor the person with ADHD um, and minimizes the risk of distraction, allows somebody to complete uh, tasks that might be a little bit boring or frustrating or a little bit tedious, those kinds of things, but to actually get things done. And so over the weekend, I kind of experimented a little bit with this idea because uh, my husband was, he, he took the kids out to the pool to go swimming for a couple of hours. And so I thought, oh, during that time, I went to the attic to do a little bit of work on the knitting machine. And I thought, well, since I'm there anyways, I turned on my camera uh, to live stream this whole thing. And so I live streamed it to Twitch. And at the same time, a couple of people, actually people from the school, <laughs> popped on and were chatting with me about the machine. They're asking questions about the machine, like, can it do cables? Can it do lace and all these kinds of things. And so I just had a little bit of a chat with people while I happened to be working on the knitting machine. And I found that it actually worked for me because I spent more time sitting there and getting things done rather than getting up and checking my phone or like trying to find a video to watch on YouTube while I was working or it just, it was less distractions because I felt somehow compelled to stay and sit there and work for longer. So originally my idea was I was just going to seam the two top seams of my sweater, my Studley sweater. But in the end, I ended up doing both of those and also hanging the sleeve and also knitting half a sleeve. And I stayed longer than I had I guess, intended because there were people at the other end um, watching and sitting and just being with me there. Um, and I felt kind of like responsible. <laughs> but in either way, it just, it helped me get more things done. And so I was thinking about this idea about how if our goal here is to help you reach your craft goals, you can't really reach your craft goals if you don't do if you don't take action if you don't actually do anything so it's definitely more than just oh here are the skills that you need to actually weave here are the step-by-step -step skills that you need to dress your loom it's more than that you actually need to do it and so if we're going to sit there and do it and do it together then hopefully it will help you actually get more things done like myself as well and so this is the thing that we are going to experiment with. So this is the studio session, which I think, I am I believe Bridget has actually mentioned in an email and uh, a couple of posts and things like that. But this is a studio session that we want to set up where the idea is it would serve as a virtual co-working session or co-crafting session. And so I would host this in Zoom. The first day that we're going to try this is going to be actually tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So the idea is that if you're a member of the school, you can go into the events calendar, find the Zoom link, and then when you're in the Zoom room at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to get together. And for the first few minutes, five minutes, three minutes, whatever it is, you can pop in the chat and just say, this is what I'm going to work on for this one hour. This is what my plan is for this one hour. This is what I'd like to get done. And then we're going to 
mute ourselves. Everybody will put themselves on mute. And then we're going to just work for 50 minutes. And you can see everybody on Zoom, but we're just going to do our thing. And as we're doing our thing, uh, hopefully you'll be able to concentrate really uh, distraction free and just work, get things done. And then the last five minutes of the session, we'll just kind of like unmute and kind of catch up with everybody. Did you do the thing that you wanted to do? Did you achieve the thing that you wanted to do? Um, what did you get done during this one hour? How did you find it? All of that kind of stuff. Um, now, that is the virtual co-working session. What I would like is hopefully for everybody to come at one o'clock because I think it would be distracting for somebody to show up sort of 20 minutes into the session. So hopefully everybody will come at the very beginning, can talk about what our goals are, and then just, you know, bring whatever it is you that you want to work on for that one session. At the same time, during that 50 minutes of dedicated work time, my plan is to also live stream what I'm making um, to YouTube. And so part of the goal with that is the idea of live streaming the actual making process. Um, because this came up in conversation with Charlotte. Charlotte was saying, I've never really watched anybody dress a loom before from beginning to end. Um, and so it's one thing to have it in a concise, here's the step-by-step -step video. We've made a course about how to dress a loom. We made a tutorial, all these kinds of things. But those are all kind of like bits and pieces. Oh, looking up close, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. But to watch the whole process kind of standing back and seeing the broad strokes of how this all comes together, I think could also be really, really interesting for some people. Um, and so that would be the idea. I'm going to, during those 50 minutes, I'm going to live stream that to YouTube. Um, and then the, hopefully the idea would that be that it would be really relaxing. It would be quiet, maybe not a lot of chat. Um, we were talking with Bridget about how she really likes, um, we were talking about like we all like these ASMR videos and um, watching just like the quiet practice of things happening. And so we made a video a couple of weeks ago about just me weaving at the loom on the Louette Spring and just the sound that it makes when you're weaving and the changing the sheds and all of that can be very, very relaxing, hopefully, to listen to for some people. Um, and so we're going to do that as a live stream. So this is from my test session from just a couple of days ago, just testing what it might look like. Um, so testing a different couple of different camera angles to see what this might be like. And the point of putting all of this together is that I need this concentrated time to do a lot of the work and a lot of the preparation work that it's going to take to create the upcoming weaving classes for the school. So <laughs> Um, I'm recording stuff for an overshot class that's going to come out soon and for a crackle class and all of these things require me to put uh, a new warp on the loom. I have to take the warp that's currently on that loom and cut it off or finish it and then cut it off, put a new warp on. All of these kinds of things need to be done. I wouldn't film it for the course because um, it kind of goes over things that we've already done before, like learning to dress a loom, um, winding a warp, all of that kind of stuff. We've already shown how to do that and how to do it really well. So we don't have to film that part again, but I feel like it could also be interesting to watch me do the process of setting this up in order to film it for the course uh, to show you guys in that concise way. So in any case, that's what we're hoping to do tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can, if you remember, you can join us in the Zoom room for all of this. Or if you want, you can also just watch the live stream on YouTube. But I feel like if you're wanting to do the concentrated work, it would probably be better if you were in the Zoom room doing that together with everyone. So that's 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 the plan. That's a goal. That's what we're going to try to do. And so I have scheduled um, a couple of days to try these uh, sessions. And so the session might involve sitting at the loom, it might be weaving, there might be a day where maybe I'm spinning, there might be a day where maybe I'm knitting a sock on the CSM, there might be uh, there might be a day where we're doing dyeing at the studio. Maybe we will live stream some of that. We'll see how that goes. So yeah, this is something that we're going to give a try. And I would like to see what you guys think about all of this and if it works for you. The next thing is the reminder about the summer to die for. Um, so you guys know that we 
just had that spinning class, uh, the spinning fiber class come out. So dyeing spinning fiber came out with Charlotte Lee. Um, and right now we're doing that color along in the discord channel. And so um, at the studio, a lot of the team members at the studio have already uh, sort of um, started to organize themselves into dye days. So they're going to dye fiber at the studio. Um, it's going to happen near the end of June, I believe, and they're going to be dyeing fiber at the studio. And so that might be some of the things that we live stream, might be some of the things that we film, um, but everybody's going to be dyeing some fiber this summer. And with that fiber, then they can do some spinning this summer as well. So we're going to do the unofficial tour de fleece spin along. And so we're going to have that thread open up probably at the end of June is what I thought I saw Vicky say. So we're going to open up that thread for tour de fleece. Um, and then you can chat about that. And then in August, we're going to have the course on dyeing large quantities of yarn, and then sort of continue along with that study group of learning how to dye with acid dyes and things like that. And then if you have uh, dyed that fiber, if you have fiber that's ready to go, then in September, we're going to do a spin along um, with the SOS, with the school, and we're going to spin specifically to knit socks. And so you can spin some of that fiber that you dyed. And then in October, we have Socktober, always Socktober in October, and we're going to knit socks. And so if you like, you can watch Tabitha's new class that's going to come out then about knitting two socks at the same time. So two at a time, T-A-A-T -A -A -T socks, or however you want to knit socks. So that is all of the stuff that's going to be happening over the next couple of months. Now, I do have on my to-do list, I'm going to put all of this information onto a page on the website so that you can find it all. <laughs> and so that you can find all the conversations that are happening and where they're happening and all that kind of stuff. And so I believe Bridget will let everyone know when that page becomes available. But yes, I'm going to be doing that very, very shortly. So as a recap, this is the stuff that is happening next month in June. So we have these studio sessions. I've set them up for Fridays at 1 p.m. And so I have one, two, three. So kind of every other week in June because the second week of June, um, the second Friday is the Taking Back Friday Live that we do. And then this whole big long stretch, this is the week where many of our team at Sweet Georgia are going to be out of the office because we are going to Chicago for H&H Americas. So this is like the first trade show that we have gone to for the knitting or yarn industry in several years since like 2019 probably um and so that's going to be really exciting <laughs> and scary um but yeah that's where many of us will be for that particular week um so we're going to be busy with that and then there's also going to be knitting meetups these are these social chats and bring your knitting bring whatever you happen to be working on and chat with robin so those happen on monday and then we have a meetup with vicky on saturdays and it says weave and spin but you can bring whatever you like and just hang out and chat and connect with the people in the school as well for those sessions. And then finally, you can see here we have live office hours last Thursday of every month at 10 o'clock in the morning. And that is what is happening next month. Oh, yes. And then I mentioned this is the sheep, shepherd and wool lesson with uh, Anna Hunter. So you can join us for that Zoom call. Um, In the community always just reminding you guys that this is where all of the conversations are happening in and around the courses so any course that you happen to take if you have questions for the instructor you can definitely come into the community section and ask questions you just uh, type at and then the instructor's name can pop up and then you can send messages um, tag them in messages so that they see and they can come and help answer if you have questions about anything so that is happening inside the community forums. We also have these groups where people are starting to um, detail more of their notes of things that they're learning and exploring and discovering. And so I'm going to show one of those things later on in the uh, share your win section. But, you know, if you're doing sort of like in-depth um, exploration into uh, working with fleece, like washing a fleece from scratch, then this would be a great place to put all of your, your conversations about all of those things. So the really just encourage you guys to explore the groups and see if you find a group that you would like to learn more about. 
And then also Discord chat. So Discord chat is something that we started for Sweet Georgia, um, sort of like as an open way for anybody in this whole big wide yarn community to connect. And so you can see our Discord channel, we have conversations about everything from crochet, dyeing, knitting, CSM knitting, machine knitting, spinning, weaving, and punch needle. Um, and then we also talk about the latest episodes of things that we posted on YouTube. We talk about uh, things that are going along in terms of the make-alongs that are happening. And so in February, we did a hold along, which is holding multiple strands of yarn together. Uh, right now we're doing a color along, which is an exploration of color, color work, using color in different ways, all of those kinds of things. And then in August, we're going to do the Sweet Georgia Mystery Knit Along in Discord as well. So all of that conversation happens on the Discord side. So you can find out more about Discord here at this link, sweetgeorgiayarns.com slash Discord. And then also, if you are a member, you can use this link here, how to join the uh, Yes, so you can go to your SOS dashboard. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there will be a way to connect your SOS account with your Discord account. And that will give you uh, like a little orange highlight to your name. And then when we see you in the Discord chat, we'll be like, oh, there's a member of the school. I recognize you. <laughs> and so that's been a really, really nice way to connect with people in this much um, kind of quicker, chattier kind of way. It's just a different way of communicating than in the forums. The forums are more like structured conversations about very specific topics. And Discord is more like free flowing and people posting photos of things that they're making in progress and things like that. So that has been happening. Now, some questions. So I received this question from Cameron via email, and they were saying that um, their singles feel very fragile and not strong, even though when I test the twist, it seems about right. Uh, I'm spinning with Jacob wool. I can't tell if this is normal or if it is just a characteristic of the fiber I'm using. Any advice on this? Should I err on the side of too much twist to fix it, or will it work itself out when I ply? So I feel like the answer here is probably to sample um there's there's two th points to this one is i would encourage you to check out rachel's class where she talks about spinning with um sheep breeds because she talks specifically about jacob wool and um she demonstrates how to spin it and all of these kinds of things um the singles feeling very fragile could be is it a too thin like not enough fiber in your single does it have enough twist? Like, is it have enough twist so that the, the yarn is actually locked and it's not going to drift apart and the, the wool is not going to drift apart? If the singles feel very fragile, like the, the fibers are going to drift away from each other, then it doesn't have enough twist in it. So it needs to have enough twist so that it doesn't fall apart when you give it a tug. And then when you fold it back for your plyback test, you're also checking does it seem like it's going to have enough twist to make a good plied yarn where Diana Twist always describes it as little grains of rice. You're looking for those little per, those little bumps, little ply bumps to look like little grains of rice. Does it look like that or do they look really long and sloopy? If they look long and stretched out, then it also probably does not have enough twist in order to create that sort of look for your yarn. Um, and then I would just probably spin a very small amount, like five grams. Spin a small amount with what you believe should be good, should work. Ply it and then wash it and then see if that's the kind of yarn that you want. See if it is still fragile. It shouldn't fall apart, but if it's still a little bit too loose or loosely plied, loosely um, spun, then the next time you spin your yarn, you'll know to give it more twist give it more ply twist and then test again. So this is something that we encourage with all different kinds of fiber. If you're using a new to you fiber, just take a small amount, five grams, 10 grams, spin a small amount, see what happens after you ply and wash it and yeah, finish your yarn and see if you like that particular yarn because that's what you're gonna take on and use in your next project. That's what you're gonna knit with, crochet with, weave with, whatever. So you need to know if it's gonna stand up for that purpose. So looking at it just when you're sitting at the wheel, I feel like is not enough. But the main thing is like the twist needs to be strong enough so that way your your singles doesn't drift apart. If it's drifting apart and breaking, then it it, it needs more twist. 
Yes, so Greta is saying it should have enough twist to not drift away if you were to rewind your singles. So if you're rewinding your singles, or if you're pulling the singles off of the bobbin and you're finding that it's breaking, then it does need more twist. Yes, Rebecca saying, I need to change my mindset to allow myself to sample more. I completely agree. I'm the same way. When I learned to spin, I would buy these beautiful braids of fiber and I'd be like, oh, 100 grams, I can make one skein of sock yarn. And so I would always take it as I have to spin this from beginning to end perfectly with like, I still do this. I still take a braid and I will divide it into however many bobbins I want to spin. And then with each one, I'm like, I can't even lose a chunk of any of the bit of this fiber. Every single inch of this fiber needs to be spun into perfect yarn. And I also need to get away from that mindset too, because then I get to the end of the hundred grams and then I don't like the yarn that I've spun. <laughs> and then I'm like, then all of that hundred grams was a waste. Um, rather than, you know, taking 10 grams, allowing yourself 10 grams to sample to see if this is actually making a yarn that you like, um, how is it going to work out for you? Because I don't know about you, but when I actually knit socks, I don't use 100 grams to knit a pair of socks. I use 70 grams to knit socks. So theoretically, I should have 30 grams that I can sample with. <laughs> so I, I know the feeling, just having to make everything uh, perfect, spin a whole full bobbin before I do anything else. I totally hear you. Um, but sampling, sample, sample, sample. That's what I learned from Kim McKenna. Because when I was um, just sitting with her and um, hearing her teach and all of the things that I learned from her, it's just sampling, trying a little bit. What happens if you do this? What happens if you do this? It's all experimentation. And then using all of that experimentation, you can find um, the best way to use any particular fiber. Because what you're going to do for this Jacob may not be what you're going to do for BFL, may not be what you're going to do for Merino, may not be what you're going to do for any other fiber. So yeah, sampling, testing. The second question is from Leslie, and it's about plying different kinds of yarns together. Um, so she says, I am a new spinner thinking about plying. Can you ply singles from different wool breeds together? Or would you ever ply singles together that were spun or prepped differently, such as a woolen spun single and a worsted spun single? Absolutely, you can definitely do this. Um, the results that you're going to get again, are going to depend on what those fibers are. So you might, you know, ply together one, one yarn, one wool yarn that will felt and shrink or full when it's washed. And then the other one, maybe that one doesn't full or felt as much. So maybe you have a long, a long wool, like a long stapled wool, like say Wensleydale, and then you have one strand that's merino that's going to felt and contract. Then when you ply the two together, one ply will contract, the other one will not, and you're going to end up with a textured sort of result. So all of these things can affect the final outcome of your yarn. It's going to affect what it's finally going to look like, what how it's going to work up in your project. You can definitely do it, but you should also sample <laughs> and test and see if that's what you like. Um, I know that uh, I have like a, a long time ago, I combined um, three different kinds of wool together to try to make a really, really strong, really, really good sock yarn. So I think I spun one strand that was all Wensleydale and one strand that was all blue face Lester and one strand that was all mohair. And the goal was then to ply all three together and then they would give each other strength in the plies, three ply yarn, and then to use that as a sock yarn. Um, so you can definitely do that, plying different wool breeds together. Again, the same idea is like a woolen spun single versus a worsted spun single. The worsted spun single will be less likely to contract or shrink or full. The woolen spun one, because it's airy, um, it might it might poof out more or it might kind of felt or full or contract a little bit more. It depends. It really depends. And so Greta's saying too, I love that about spinning, mixing different singles, different drafts. Yes. It's a lot of different things that you can do. And if this is part of the reason why I also encourage you to check out the uh, textured spinning class with Debbie Held, um, because I think it opens up your mind to different ways of creating yarn, that it doesn't all have to be uniform, one type of yarn. So there's that. Um, this is, no, it's this one. 
this one, this question was, I am taking the spinning from scratch class and I would love to see how you situate yourself with the Saxony wheel. I struggle having everything over to my left when I'm right-handed. I am right-handed as well. So it's probably better if I actually have a photo and maybe I'll do a video or maybe I'll live stream this. But sitting at my particular Saxony wheel, my flyer is on the right-hand side. When I spin, I spin with my left hand as my fiber hand and my right hand as my drafting hand. So I draft forward and to the right. But I'm right-handed. I believe I've been told that I spin backwards from how everybody else spins if they're right-handed. So I think it really ultimately depends. I specifically was looking for a Saxony wheel where the flyer was on the right because my drafting hand is my right hand. So if you have a Saxony wheel and your flyer's on the left, then it would be if you were holding your fiber in the right hand and drafting forward with your left hand. That would probably feel more ergonomic and less twisted. So that's something to consider. That's probably also why these castle wheels like the Schacht Matchless or like many of these wheels, Ladybug, um, any of the Louette wheels, they're all sort of centered. So that way there's no directionality. And so it should be more ergonomic if you're sitting at a wheel like that. Um, so that's that's how I have myself set up with my particular Saxony wheel. And Elena's asking about when it comes to spinning for socks, I feel like I don't have enough in the braid to risk sampling. I get about 330 yards to a four ounce braid. Um, yeah, I feel like if you spin a thicker yarn for your four ounces, you're going to hopefully need fewer stitches to get the same kind of circumference for your socks. So um, it might be possible that you won't use. Yeah, it's very difficult to compare your, you know, 425 yards per 100 grams commercial sock yarn to what you spin. Because if you're spinning yarn and you're getting 330 yards, maybe your yarn is thicker and maybe you could go with a smaller number of stitches, a fewer number of stitches in order to create the same kind of sock that would fit your foot. So yeah, that's where a lot of experimentation needs to happen too. So we have a couple of things that I wanted to share with you guys that I found in the forums. And the first thing is this beautiful, beautiful tapestry that Pearl did. This is just one of several photos that you can find if you go to Pearl's Tapestry Studies uh, thread. And so um, it was maybe, yeah, I'm wondering which year we did the tapestry study group. But this study group was started a couple of years ago. Um, and maybe it was last year. There's uh, there, Everybody was weaving tapestry, looking at set, trying different things, using um, different kinds of weft yarns, learning how to do meet and separate and all sorts of things like that. Uh, working through a number of the exercises that Jana had created for the courses that we made for tapestry. And I remember when that study group finished, many of the people who were in that study group were like, oh, well, we just want to keep weaving tapestry, but the study group is over. And so um, in the background, I know that many of these uh, weavers continued to practice their tapestry skills. And it is really, really cool to see Pearl do that tapestry course initially. And you can see the samples that she created that time. And now to come back to it a while later um, and work through things again and start to explore her own ideas. I think it's really, really neat. Like you can see the kinds of things that are happening down here where there's mixing and blending of um, like a gradient effect from mixing different plies of yarns together, different colored plies. And so this is like, this is all sort of dark colored and this is a little bit more mixed and this is getting a little bit lighter. And so there's these kind of gradient effects happening. It's beautiful. Like the selvages are beautiful. It's yeah, really, really, really lovely. And you can just see how much um, Pearl's weaving has evolved over over time. And so she is saying, I hope others will also share their work in this group. And so, um, 
it's it's nice to see people come and revisit the things that they had learned before because after a bit of time has passed and you come back and you start your hand at it again um you'll see how much muscle memory has developed you'll see how much you remember and then it just allows you to grow even further so yeah very very excited to see all that happening so thanks for sharing that pearl uh i have another one here that these were posted very shortly after last month's live office hours and i was so so excited to share them with you and i kept looking at them and i was wondering if anybody else had seen them too but these are from amanda amanda has been doing a bunch of carding of different colors um color mixing through carding and then spinning all of these samples it's incredible and so you can maybe see that this has actually been set up as an album and so this is one of the features or the functions that we've started to add to the uh, community section so in here you can go to the galleries and look at the project galleries and things like that and amanda has set up this whole thing as a project gallery uh, there's 38 photos of all of the sample yarns that she has spun uh, i'm curious actually amanda is in the chat here i'm wondering uh, what you will make with all of this wonderful yarn, because it seems like it would be perfect for something like tapestry weaving, where you need a lot of gradation between different colors and be, be able to like do a lot of shading, like these yellows to greens, orange to greens, the, these greens are beautiful. Yeah, it is extremely impressive. So um, yeah, I encourage you guys to go check out this album, see how this all works and how it comes together. Um, and just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So Amanda's saying it would be good for tapestry or embroidery. Yes, I agree. I wonder how fine it's been spun. Yeah, really, really lovely. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I was saying about Elena, Elena, this is what I was talking about. Elena, who's also here in the chat, um, created this gallery of the Rolags that she has been creating on the blending board. So this is the Ashford blending board. And look at these beautiful Rolags coming off of this. Now this is, uh, I took a screenshot because I wanted to capture all of the different um, photos that she's put in here, but you can also jump in here and see all of these photos up close. Rolex are always so, so fun to look at because you can see you know, all of the different colors, the nuance of colors happening in here. There's just a pop of turquoise and all of this orange. You just wonder how all of this is going to spin up. Again, these would be perfect for Debbie's textured spinning class. Um, I'm just curious also what you would like to spin from all of these, Elena. Uh, it says Rolex and other fiber arrangements produced from my blending board. Most of the fiber is mystery fiber. <laughs> So that is fun. That's a really, really wonderful way of using fiber that you happen to have on hand. They're beautiful. Rolag pictures are always so satisfying to look at. I also have here Kathleen. Kathleen posted a gallery of uh, knitting projects that she has been working on. And so this one here in the corner, this is the Ridgeline shawl. This was designed by Tabitha and Kathleen knit this entire shawl. And then these photos of a double-sided baby blanket. So they are four log cabin squares on one side and then four mitered squares on the other side. So it's a reversible blanket. One side is log cabin. The other side is mitered squares. It's very, very cool. Um, and it must be such a cozy, cozy baby blanket. Nice and thick and cozy. And the two sides, the front and the back side, have been joined together by using crochet. Yeah, very squishy. Looks wonderful. Fantastic. Great to see all you guys and your projects here. And this is Vicky's dye garden. So I wanted to share this with you because we have um, talked before about the idea of dyeing, planting your own dye garden. And uh, you can sort of follow the saga that Vicky has gone through, you know, from acquiring the seeds, buying the seeds, and then starting the seeds. You, you go to um, this thread, Adventures in Growing and Dying and Eco-Printing. Uh, you'll see sort of like how she got the seeds started and then what happened. And uh, you, this is, it is a journey. 
<laughs> it is a journey to, to create a dye garden. I know I started my dye garden twice last year and unsuccessfully both times. And so it is just such a joy to see these little sprouts, these little shoots happening and they look healthy and reaching for the sun looks fantastic. So congratulations on having plants grow, Vicki. That looks great. If anyone else wants to start a dye garden, there is this plant, a natural dye garden class that is taught by Caitlin French, and it is super fun. Yes, it is the journey of life and death a few times. <laughs> I hear you. And the last project that I want to share today is also Vicky's woven curtains. So she wove all of the cloth to make these curtains, which are beautiful, and they have like one panel has this kind of light coming through it. And then the yeah, there's some panels that have more light, there's some panels that have less light because they're more dense because of the weave structure that was used. Um, and so you can watch the gallery, you see the gallery of her hand woven curtains. It is epic. It is a lot of fabric to weave, right? Um, but she says, I won't go into too many details or point out things I could have done differently. These are beautiful and that is all I want to talk about. <laughs> so I think that that is wonderful because sometimes you just want to enjoy. We don't have to talk about like, oh, what I should have done here or what I should have done there. Just enjoy. It looks fantastic. Celebrate. They are amazing curtains. That's a huge accomplishment. So if you are curious about weaving or want to learn how to weave or want to learn how to do any of these things, we do have all the weaving classes there. And so you guys can check out that section as well if you have not already. The last thing we have here today is the giveaway that we're going to do. We do this once a month, every month for our SOS members. You can go to this link here schoolofsweetgeorgia.com slash May 2023 live. And that will give you, um, it's like a little form. And we're just asking you if this session was helpful, what you would put into practice, what uh, you found the most useful thing about today. Um, and that just kind of helps us prepare for all of the future sessions and things like that. And as the giveaway, what we have uh, is we'll pick a random, we'll pick a random winner. And that person will receive uh, the Stitch Diaries Season 3 from Sweet Georgia. And so the Stitch Diaries is something that we have been doing once a quarter. It's once a season. And um, it basically features and highlights one of the dyers on our Sweet Georgia team. And so this time it is by Kathy. And Kathy has dyed a sock blank called that uh, they have given the name Hillside Splendor. Um, and uh, I don't have a photo of it with me. I should have a photo, but you can look online. Um, here, I can put the link. Can I put the link? Yes, I can put the link. I'll put the link here. So that's where the Stitch Diaries is. And then it also comes with Skein of Cayenne on Tough Love Sock. It also comes with um, a scarf recipe that is written by Tabitha. And so all of this stuff is really, really nice. And it also comes with this little, um, little faux leather label that we made earlier this year. And so that's going to be really fun. So it's a whole kit. It's a whole package. Stitch Diaries season three has a sock blank, has a skein of yarn, and then has all of these stitch dictionaries in order to create a scarf, whatever it is you want to make. You could weave with the two things. You could use one for warp and one for weft. It'd be lots of different things that you could do. So looking forward to seeing what you make with this particular giveaway, but that is the link and that is where everything will be. Fantastic. Thank you guys for being here today. It's always wonderful to see you guys every month here on the live office hours. I hope that I'll see you guys tomorrow for that um, studio session. It's going to be an experiment. We're going to see what happens. But I am really, really looking forward to that and seeing if maybe it is helpful to you. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe it will be helpful to you in actually getting things done. So I encourage you to bring your project, sit with me, hang out. It's going to be no chatting because we're going to be concentrating on actually getting things done. Um, and hopefully that will be a good time for everyone. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being in the school, for being a part of all of this, for learning together with us. And it is wonderful to see everybody here. And I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow or next month.
All right. See you guys. Bye for now.